Das auf Mann. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Bienvenue and Inde Men Walachu. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. I will ask the IT people if they can share the slides already. Thank you very much for joining us for this IGF session to launch the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network report on framing, mapping, and addressing cross-border digital policies for Africa, for in the African Union. My name is Tracy Sinkamba Fosta, and I'm the International Research and Project Management Coordinator at the INJPN. This session will be introduced by Martin Hallen, INJPN's Deputy Executive Director. And for those of you that are joining the session, thanks for joining us online. We will have the welcome and introduction presentation of the report, a roundtable discussion with our esteemed guests Nima Lungangira and Jean-Paul Adam, and uh, followed by the next steps of the project process. So over to you, Martin, for your opening remarks. Thank you, Tracy, and welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, and we also wanted to, again, extend a big thanks to the hosts uh, of the IGF 2022 that enabled us to have this exchange, but also a big, big thank you to a lot of uh, members of the community that contributed to the report that we'll be uh, presenting today, and of course also uh, to the partners that enabled the support uh, of the report, uh, of whom we'll be sp speaking about more uh, as I move ahead. Uh, before I start, I would like to share also a few brief points in French, just to make sure that our Francophone audience also uh, uh, has a little bit more information on the availability of the document in French as well. So, bonjour à tous. J'ai le plaisir de vous accueillir à cette session de la IGF, uh, qui uh, lancera le Internet Jurisdiction Status Report sur le cadrage, la cartographie et uh, le traitement des politiques numériques transfrontalières uh, dans l'Union africaine. Nous sommes ravis de présenter ce rapport qui a été produit avec le soutien de la GIZ au nom du ministère uh, allemand uh, de la coopération économique et développement BMZ. Et le rapport est maintenant disponible en anglais. Cependant, une version française sera bientôt disponible et lancée lors d'un événement dédié uh, pour le présenter. Pour l'instant, les participants francophones peuvent accéder au résumé exécutif en français en ligne et euh, nous avons des collègues en ligne euh, dans le Zoom euh, qui sont en train de euh, partager le lien pour le télécharger et aussi après la présentation aujourd'hui, euh, on va présenter un coup à corte et une adresse euh, pour télécharger aussi euh, le executive summary en français. So with this, uh, again, I'm so pleased to welcome you uh, today. And again, big thanks also to GIZ uh, on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Creation, uh, uh, Cooperation and Development that enabled us to uh, work on this exciting project over the course of the last 18 months. So developing interoperable cross-border digital policies is an increasingly complex uh, policy challenge, yet it lies at the forefront of leveraging uh, digital technologies and the data economy to improve societies and the reach, uh, to reach the sustainable development goals. For the past 10 years, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network has been working to support the multi-stakeholder cooperation across different sectors. And also, it has become increasingly clear that scalable solution pathways cannot be developed without comprehensive understanding of the highly complex and complicated dynamic digital ecosystem that surrounds us with a lot of silos and a lot of also unintended consequences of regulation that's being put out uh, left and right. New and innovative policy approaches are needed now more than ever to facilitate data sharing and leverage digital technologies to reach the SDGs. And this is now nowhere more evident than here in Africa, after having heard also the sessions uh, at this IGF so far, um, as this is one of the regions also where in the follow up to COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, the digital transformation of economies, governments, and societies is sharply accelerating. 
against the backdrop of the ambitious strategic uh, frameworks of the Agenda 2063, the African Continental Free Trade Area, and the recently endorsed AU policy uh, framework, we have embarked with the Internet Jurisdiction Policy Network to enable peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange of stakeholders in the region as they frame, map, and address cross-border digital policy challenges. And the report that we'll be presenting to you today builds on a unique methodology of the network to mutualize knowledge of key regional stakeholders from states, companies, technical operators, international organizations, civil society, and academia, whom we engage through interviews, surveys, and workshops. So we really, really hope that today the findings that you will see will contribute to the broader continental project of data policy harmonization envisioned also by the digital transformation strategy of the African Union Commission. And as Africa seeks to build its path and strengthen its regional voice in global policy debates, we hope that the report and especially the community that has helped to develop it will support further dialogue and evidence-based research to foster coordination on cross-border digital policies across the region. And thank you for indulging this monologue. And with this, Tracy, I'm going back to you uh, to introduce our first speakers. Thank you very much. To kickstart, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Regina Greenberger. I hope I've said that really well in German. Thank you. <laughs> Who is the Director for Cyber, Foreign, and Security Policy at the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Her previous experience was chiefly in the field of EU foreign policy as well as EU financial economic policy. Thank you for joining us today and I welcome you for some opening remarks. This, this okay. Thank you Tracy and thank you Martin and uh, Jean-Paul and Honorable Nima uh, and Dr. Alison Gilbert. For, for having me here. As uh, Tracy said, I was, uh, I am the, currently the cyber ambassador, as uh, uh, the abbreviation of my formal title is. And uh, in, this, um, in this regard, I'm, I'm happy to contribute here to this session. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor we are launching the Internet and Jurisdiction uh, Regional Status Report today which provides comprehensive insights from research on cross-border digital policies in Africa. We understand that the development and harmonization of digital policies is an important priority to the African Union and many of its member states. The German government is delighted to support this important effort to work towards closing digital gaps and using opportunities of the digital transformation in order to strengthen the digital and economic integration in the region as well as globally. We applaud um, the African Union Commission in its ongoing work on the AU data policy framework, which will establish a common basis for regional organizations and member states to develop data policies and regulation. Um, this comprehensive and forward-looking framework can ensure that Africans step into opportunities triggered by datafication while mitigating risks and ensuring equal benefits and rights in the digital space. It's a wonderful opportunity that the United Nations Internet Governance Forum 2022, hosted here for the first time in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, gives us the opportunity to present and discuss the key findings of the report in the heart of Africa and the headquarter of the AU Commission itself. The report combines a regional data collection engaging over 100 stakeholders from across Africa, countries, internet companies, technical operators, civil society, academia and international organizations. Germany and specifically the Federal German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development has prioritized projects for digital development significantly in recent years. There is a need for more coherence in policies for the construction of an integrated regional digital ecosystem, not only during the pandemic, but beyond. Better coordination and coherence are essential in order to make the digital transformation inclusive and sustainable so that nobody is left behind. 
Therefore, I'm very glad this first regional status report provides an evidence-based overview about facts, um, trends, and challenges for the digital transformation of economies, governments, and societies in Africa. Hence, it sets the basis for a better understanding of the fast-paced developments of Internet-related activities in the region and for further action and decision-making. I'm convinced that coordinated action in the digital realm is key to the success in an interconnected and dependent world. It is therefore one of our aims to foster international cooperation and dialogue on such topics for which we are here today. That is why we are pleased to have established a trusted cooperation with the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network when we funded the first Internet and Jurisdiction Global Status Report in Latin America and the Caribbean. The findings of these reports constitute the base for many following discussions and can be used for continued capacity development of all stakeholders. In addition to greater coherence and coordination, we agree that increased investment in the digital market could help to overcome the economic and social consequences that economies all over the world are suffering from as a result of the pandemic. It could also be an opportunity to generate jobs and foster inclusion as well as gender equality. In other words, the importance of the alignment of a legal framework regarding internet and jurisdiction policy lies in two main points which are strongly related to each other. On the one hand, strengthening a unified and inclusive digital transformation through adequate legal and institutional frameworks in the region can help to better overcome the pandemic in the sense of guaranteeing the ability to work, education, access to health services and information. On the other hand, the opportunity to generate jobs through further digitization and working towards a digital common market can turn this sector into a boost that helps the region economically. We hope these recommendations from the report can help strengthening cooperation among countries by promoting free and secure intra-African data flows, paving the way to achieve a digital single market in Africa. The pandemic has painfully shown us how interconnected we truly are. Just like with the regulation of the Internet, uncoordinated action can have adverse effects on others. Cooperation is therefore the key to mutually beneficial development. Germany is and will continue to be a reliable partner uh, to aim for this goal. I wish you a very fruitful discussion today and want to thank all involved stakeholders for the input they have provided for this report. I hope it will be a tool to further support our partners in the development of digital policies and create strong human-centered regulation in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you can, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. <laughs> Greenberger. And also to echo what Martin said uh, in his opening remarks, we are very excited to share this report, uh, which was enabled by uh, the ministry's support. So thank you very much. In our next uh, slide, I just wanted to share with you our pre, uh, in a, in a pre uh, look that these will be our speakers uh, for the roundtable discussions. So, Dr. so Nima Lungangiro, who's a member of parliament, Jean-Paul Adam, who's director of technology and climate change, and also we're inviting uh, Andrew Renz, who will be joining us online. Uh, I would like to take you through um, how we got to this journey so far with you all today. So the cross-border digital policies um, for Africa in the African Union is a two-year project, as I mentioned, supported by the German ministry, and it complements existing regional mechanisms for stakeholders on the African continent, in the African continent, to share knowledge, consult one another, interact with stakeholders around the world, and develop a shared understanding of capacity. And it is furthermore, we're ensuring, uh, a, we want to ensure a meaningful multi-stakeholder participation and provide the information needed to develop interoperable policy and regulatory frameworks for the digital 21st century. 
support the evolution of digital single market, and contribute to Africa's Agenda 2063 and the UN Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. So through the utilization of the regional mechanisms that we have had, the partnerships, the recurring workshops, uh, there will be a multimedia learning modules for policymakers, which you'll hear a little bit more about at the end of this session, and obviously today's launch on the regional status report uh, for cross-border digital policies in the African Union. So this project consolidates the timely information needed to enable the necessary capacity building to pursue an inclusive and digital transformation on, on, on ba based on evidence. So the, um, the re the how we got to this, the work follows on from INJPN's work, uh, and it's uh, on in the Latin America Regional Status Report, and also a global uh, status report, which were developed in 2019 and 2020. We have seen that there are similar broader challenges and issues that have resonated in this report, which include the disparity of unilateral measures, uh, coordination challenge among numerous actors, the tension between free trade trade uh, free data flows and digital sovereignty, the role in global debate, the narrative, data extraction, and the aspiration to regional integration. I would like to introduce you to the team on uh, the right-hand side, and you can see, and which was shared by Dr. Greenberg as well, the, um, the participation that has been involved throughout this process so far. Uh, including in the knowledge dialogue workshops, the data contributors for the uh, online survey and the interviews combined, stakeholders, over 300 that had engaged in the project, and more than 50 countries that have been part of the stakeholder groups where we collected the data. We'd also like to thank our data, con uh, our contributors and participants, interviewees and partners, this list uh, is not exhaustive, but it represents the many actors that have made this important work possible. I've included a timeline over here just to show you the different activities that we've undertaken. And we're now in the fifth phase, which is the pre pre presentation of the report, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Alison Gilwald. So now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Alison Gilwald, who is the Executive Director of Research ICT Africa and part of the authoring team of the report to present the report. So over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Turn on the mic. Um, actually, you've got the, uh, Yeah, the I can do it. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Martin. So um, the next few slides that we're going to be looking at um, are the outcome of the um, INJ methodology that Martin referred to. Um, it draws on um, a kind of crowd um, sourcing methodology that uh, uses uh, a, a survey that uh, was applied in certain um, meetings and conferences, but also could be um, voluntarily answered online. It included some responses from um, mentees done during knowledge dialogues. and. Um, just for the statisticians in the room before they get to, to itchy, um, the um, percentages are really to show the kind of relational aspects of the, of the responses. So there's no sort of, you know, representative sampling frame or anything for this. It's really trying to kind of assess some of the perceptions around some of these issues and the relational dimensions of that. So um, one of the important areas of the report relate to um, policy coordination. And the, the responses to the question of whether African or African countries, the statement that African countries need to work more together on digital issues, um, is reflected in this um, in this uh, uh, Likert scale, really. That's that's represented here, and you can see that uh, there's a very very strong sense that uh, African countries need to work far more closely together, um, and you know that still 24% to agree, and then. You know, a 9% that strongly disagree and not clear always from these kinds of things what, what those reasons are, but clearly a very strong feeling um, with, you know, uh, that supports the, or resonates with the, uh, 
view that when um, investigating Af with African stakeholders that, that we found that um, policy coordination and a you know, common digital narrative was a very important aspect and that stakeholders um, really underscored the need for African countries to further elaborate and articulate uh, data policy goals, um, both inside the continent but also, also outside. Um, so the important issue before I carry on about these responses is that specifically on something like the, the coordination um, issue is that this was done over the um, timeline that Tracy's already spoken to, so it was done over um, several uh, months starting earlier in this year. And at some point, um, the Africa data policy framework actually was released and disseminated, although the Africa member states agreed to that in um, in March, I believe, um, earlier this year, it was only disseminated later, and so it really wasn't popularised at the time that some of these responses came out. Uh, so it's very timely that, you know, in regard to the question of there needing to be more coordination, we now actually have this framework um, that, uh, in, in, the, in the data um, policy framework, that it will be able to respond to some of the responses that are, are here. Um, then the, the other area that arose from the um, uh, perception survey of, of, of the um, uh, interviews that were done as well. In, in, re in response to the question, is, um, there is a common, there is strong coordination among African countries regarding digital policy if issues, and the response there was that most people disagreed. Okay, they said they felt that there was not adequate um, coordination amongst African countries. Um, you can see again, um, also a number of people agreeing or being neutral at least not, not disagreeing, and then small numbers disagreeing. Um, and here, you know, this is also um, just really enforcing the idea that uh, there are these, um, you know, global challenges that we need to co coordinate on, um, that we need to develop a, uh, a common narrative on what a digital single market means, on what um, our, our, you know, in uh, commitment to uh, digital single market, our uh, policy and regulatory environment, the kind of certainty that we're going to need for um, investment. Um, these are all uh, issues that will require high levels of, of coordination. Um, and of course, to bring Af uh, African voices to these, to these discussions. Um, and then just some of the continent-specific challenges that arose from, from these discussions. Um, and again, some, you know, some of them actually reflected also in the um, cross-regional um, analysis that uh, Tracy provided earlier. But of course, you know, when often <laughs> when we're comparing these regional studies, we're often comparing other regions with, you know, 11, 13 countries, six, if you know, MENA or um, Southeast Asia, you know, maybe go, go, go up um, a little bit more. But, um, you know, we're talking about a very, very large continent. Um, and so the size, the number of countries, the geographic um, extension of the, of, of the region, um, and of course the diverse political systems within the region are all, um, you know, uh, really sort of mass, massive, massive uh, challenges if you're looking towards coordination. Um, and then, of course, we've got this very large uh, geographic distribution of populations um, over some, you know, very sparsely um, populated areas, and then, of course, some very... Um, dense ones, but again across a, a massive geographic terrain. Uh, we have these very uneven levels of development that we are all um, aware of and seek to um, ad address in various initiatives, including the uh, data policy frameworks, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and various of the things that are the context for this. Um, <laughs> I was just... Uh, as I read, this persistence of war and climate-induced crises, um, and I suppose Africa is not alone there. This is a, a global, a global challenge. Um, and then, of course, we do have, uh, rem you know, there still are institutional constraints um, and uh, infrastructural constraints. Uh, institutional constraints probably even even larger than some of the infrastructural constraints, particularly as we already have to move to new um, institutional. Um, arrangements when we haven't even addressed previous ones. Um, and then, of course, as, again, as in many other regions, there are competing visions of what, uh, you know, digital society is going to, should look like. Uh, and, again, like other um, regions, challenges to, um, to integrate, so our efforts for integration and regional coordination um, 
you know, uh, have reached different levels in different um, um, initiatives, but it still remains a, a big challenge. Actually, full harmonization is, I think, everybody agrees quite, quite a way off. And then in relation to um, the uh, issue of, of data flow specifically, um, and there in the, the, the general perception was that, you know, it, there's a very positive view around the potential of, of data and a, and a digital and data economy within the single market, um, and quite an, you know, um, an appetite to engage on this issue. Um, and the question there was, data flows are beneficial. And 48% um, of people said um, they agree, 41% of people said they, um, uh, sorry, 48% said they strongly agree, 41% said they agree, and then you can see a very minimal number of people who, who didn't feel this was a, a correct and positive statement. Um, numerous initiatives showing the, um, so there are numerous initiatives showing the consciousness of this issue, um, both of digital and data policies in Africa. And um, of course there you know, are a number of long-standing initiatives like the African Union's Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, uh, com commonly known as the Malibu Convention. Um, this is uh, a piece of uh, a convention, a piece of law, that uh, treaties that has been in place for, I think it must be about close eight, eight years now. Um, unfortunately has not had enough countries ratify it. So um, what was seen as a very positive framework uh, for harmonization in Africa um, has really faced uh, challenges both in ratification and therefore in many countries hasn't been um, even implemented. Um, and then there have been initiatives such as Smart Africa over the last um, a few years that has really built um, private sector initiatives in the country, although it is a, a multi-stakeholder initiative, it's built a strong public-private um, um, interplays and relationships, um, focusing on a number of areas, including um, data protection. Um, and then there have been some uh, you know, uh, other initiatives within regions, and we just present one here is the SADC Parliamentary Forum um, on the Digital Economy and Model Law. That's still in its, its final phases. Um, and then, of course, the really big framing for a lot of these initiatives within the African um, uh, Union Digital Transformation Strategy, or the African Union more generally, um, is the African Continental Free Trade Area, um, in which uh, um, the, the digital a single market is a, a very important aspect. And of course, the um, enabling um, uh, conditions that a digitization or digital readiness create for um, improved integrated trade across, across the continent. And then finally, and very sort of directly to this, we have the Africa Data Policy Framework, um, which you know is very uh, um, clear on the need for um, data uh, value creation on the continent, the recognition of this as a strategic asset, and that very often that value creation um, doesn't happen without um, adequate data flows. So these need to require, you know, need to protect citizens and that, but they're absolutely critical to that. So that's um, something that has emerged during this process and it provides a, a very nice framework um, there, um, specifically because it also is now in its second phase with an implementation um, phase um, precisely to address some of the problems that these previous uh, um, policies have struggled with. Um, and then, of course, there was this big uh, question that always faces us around harmonization. Um, we don't have the same uh, legal instruments as the European Union or as probably the best example of a, a, you know, a completely harmonized uh, legal uh, entity. Um, and so a lot of the documents, are, a lot of the uh, frameworks, a lot of the intentions, however, is that we move towards that harmonization, and particularly in the area of data um, and the, the, the data economy, that it is really only going to be through you know, quite high levels of integration that we're going to be able to get the necessary economies of scope and scale that you need for, for um, uh, effective data um, creation and for effective data economies. Um, and there, you know, within the harmonization um, uh, considerations, there are multiple sub-regional and thematic groupings, um, you know, within ECOWAS, within SADC, um, that, that many of these things are able to plug now into the Africa Digital uh, Transformation Strategies, um, Africa Data Policy Framework. Um, 
just to stress, we've already said, but emerging frame, you know, the emerging frameworks um, that are there include some of those we've already mentioned, the Manaba Convention, the Continental Free Trade Area or um, Agreement. And then, of course, all of this is happening in terms of the, the big, you know, Agenda 2063, which is this vision of a, um, you know, um, modernized, um, a free, um, you know, very significant um, force on the, Af on the or Africa being a very significant force in the global community. And, and so that provides this uh, very powerful framework for us to, to work within. And then importantly, particularly in terms of the, um, Af the data policy framework, and I think a number of initiatives now, um, and especially from lessons learned from the Malabo Convention and the inability to get the necessary ratifications for operationalization is that we you know shouldn't wait around for uh, complete uh, harmonization before we move on on various of these things and uh, we acknowledge that with the large numbers of countries at different stages of of development and a very sort of diversity of political systems and regulatory frameworks um, and very different degrees of digital readiness in order to move um, some of these processes forward um, that there's an increasing you know, notion, which is very much, again, in the data policy framework, of progressive realization of these objectives. We've got this very, very ambitious framework. We've got these very um, you know, um, powerful t objectives and targets. Um, but we need to get a commitment in all, to all of those in principle, which we have in the a African data policy framework. But it's, we've got to accept that different countries will reach different um, milestones of that at different times. And so I suppose the really important questions arising from that is, you know, are there lessons that we can learn from, from European integration experience? As I said, our situation is quite, quite different from theirs, where there's a very strong um, regulation and directives regime, which allows for um, enforcement um, of, of, of regulation, um, which, of course, our um, African uh, Union does not allow for. Um, so all of these commitments that are being made by member states, these are, these are voluntary commitments. Um, obviously, when they're in a formal treaties, then they're, they're more than that, but then they're not getting ratified. And so I suppose another, you know, important question that we asked here, which we can come to in the, in the round table, is, you know, what, what combination of functional interoperability and fully harmonized approaches might best create the necessary coordination with African countries? And I think you can see some sort of pragmatism in some of the um, frameworks that we've got now, where we're saying, you know, let's not wait for full harmonization, let's at least accept, for example, in relation to data, common data standards. So at least there's a level of interoperability and so that people can participate in, for example, the continental free trade area. Um, Tracy, how are we doing yeah, for time? You've got uh, okay. three minutes. Okay, let's quickly finish up the digital and data infrastructure then. Um, so this is obviously a critical aspect of um, you know, uh, realizing a, a data economy on the continent of the digital transformation strategy, um, a visions and the gender 20, uh, uh, 2063 vision is that we have to address these issues while other data frameworks are dealing with, um, you know, the hard uh, data regulatory issues already on their own. Um, many of these preconditions are, are already met. And yet in our country, although there's been our countries, although there's be, there have been um, enormous gains uh, within ter in terms of connectivity and with um, rollout of, 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 of backbone infrastructure, terrestrial background, um, backbone infrastructure, and undersea cables, um, there's obviously still important um, developments there. And we have heard in various sessions this morning the importance of satellites and various things that will support that. Um, Obviously, with, with regard to data infrastructure, there are still enormous issues around data centers um, and the, you know, the viability of these. They, from a policy point of view, from a national interest point of view, there have been very important debates around that, which hopefully we again can um, raise in some of the, the, the roundtable discussion. Um, but the, you know, the, the ultimate kind of point on this is that Africa still lags um, many, many other regions. Um, and these are not only infrastructural. You know, importantly, there are very large demand side challenges. So that's, you know, really kind of classical human development challenges. And in many ways, these are far more difficult to um, uh, fix than some of the infrastructural challenges. Issues around skills, human, you know, development issues around skills, the issues of affordability, affordability of devices and of data. And then, you know, this really impacted negatively on, um, on really digital and data takeoff. 
And I think we are going to have to quickly try and fit in the yes. data sharing development because well, I we think we can go to moving forward then. Okay, because just this is—I'll just be very, very quick on this, just to say that this absolutely is a critical issue, um, uh, data sharing, and you know, it's in all the discussions that came out very, very strongly that we need to develop common um, data standards and formats for interoperability. Um, we need to foster the governance of data communities. Um, especially for cross-border purposes, so um, that we need to look at different um, uh, kind of subject and thematic communities, so we need particular um, uh, things for health, for, for example, health or research, but also for, for um, actual physical um, um, communities, and that in order to deal with this, we should be looking at alternative forms of, of data stewardship and of access in terms of uh, uh, data sharing. So we should be looking at the, the, the potential of data commons um, and of data trusts. Um, let's move on because we've not got much more. So the role of um, Africa in global governance for this is a very important thing that emerged is that everybody felt very strongly that we need to move towards a, a, a common African narrative, that there were sometimes competing narratives, which was fine, um, but we also really needed to um, be able to, um, you know, have a single voice um, where we're able to represent African interests um, in, in, in form forums of global governance. Um, so, you know, it's very clear that data governance is very high up on the international agenda and, and, um, and in, in fora like, such as this. Um, but very often African stakeholders are not active um, as, as they should be, and it's wonderful that it's being hosted here in Ethiopia and we've got so much um, uh, African participation, but this is not always the case. And it definitely, you know, in standard setting bodies and these kinds of um, other forums of, of global governance and of decision making, um, African voices are very often um, entirely absent. And in the re relation to standards, Africa is very much a standard um, a, a receiver um, and not a standard setter. So you know, influencing those agendas, influencing um, those standards is very important. Um, I think some of those questions that are up on the screen, we can hopefully also tackle in the round table, um, issues around um, you know, impact assessments that might be used um, uh, from other regions, looking at what um, the extraterritorial impact of their regulations um, might be to, to prevent the kind of unintended consequences that they might have. So, for example, you know, assessing what the extra, extra, extraterrestrial implications of, for example, GDPR, what has that had? We've seen enormous impacts of that you know, on the continent um, in, con in contexts which are quite different and not what they intended to be, even by the GDPR themselves. Um, so I think we'll just have to go on. Tracy, where are you? I'm moving forward. Do you want to? Maybe a minute. Yeah. Can, 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 we, can yes. we take a minute? Yes. Okay. So um, if we go to moving um, moving forward, uh, another important uh, response in the um, the survey was uh, the state in response to the statement: African countries need to work together to regulate data. Um, you saw again the strong desire for for um, collaboration and for coordination and for um, working together on this, and there was a. Um, view that in, as, we, as this work is taken forward, there needs to be far more research to be able to influence digital policy outlook that at the moment, you know, we're going on a kind of perception survey like this, we need a strong evidence base um, in order to uh, develop policy. Um, the African Union is in the perfect position now with the Africa Data Policy Framework to coordinate and co co collaborate with African stakeholders on evidence-based policy development, um, particularly on the issue of cross-border flows, which is the focus here. Um, and that really relates to the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the African Data Policy Framework now has this implementation framework and this capacity building um, phase that will go with it that will really allow us to move towards um, the domestication and the implementation of this policy um, at the national and regional level. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison, for taking us through that. I've just shared with you a slide here. And for your information, the report is now available online. It was made available as we started this, um, this session. So you can find it on our INJ website and also by connecting to the link here and QR code. And QR code is just behind me as well. So um, I would like to introduce our panel discussion uh, and our speakers for the panel discussion. And first up, we have 
Nima Lungangira, Honorable Nima Lungangira, who is a member of parliament from Tanzania, will then be followed by Jean-Paul Adam, who is the director for technology and climate change and natural resources at UNECA, who are also our hosts for the IGF. And uh, online we have uh, Dr. Andrew Renz, who has been key in putting together the questions for this, um, the data collection. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Andrew Renz after our speakers to uh, share some reactions as well from the, uh, from the report and the findings that we've just heard. So first up, I'd like to introduce Nima. Please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. And I must say I'm very, very, very humbled to get this opportunity. And I'll start off with a quote uh, from Dr. Allison's um, presentation, where she said, African voices are usually entirely absent. This has been the case for parliamentarians in a lot of uh, global, global sittings. And it is in realization of that absentism of our participation as parliamentarians, we decided to form the African Parliamentary Network of Internet Governance, APNIG, which at the moment has about 36 members. And I have the greatest honor and, and privilege and challenge of being the chairperson. Um, and here at the UNIGF in Ethiopia, 23 of us are here. And we're very grateful for the support of GIZ, who has supported um, a good number of us to be here, as well as um, the UNIGF, who, are also, who have also supported um, another, a, few, a few of us to be here. And, um, we hope that this will be the, the beginning, not, not just for this um, particular event, but there is a lot of effort and there's a lot of value in us being here because everything that has been discussed at the end of the day needs parliamentarians. And when we are absent, then we cannot be blamed for not taking any action, but usually we, fingers are pointed to us whilst we are not aware of why the fingers are being appointed to us. Now, just very shortly in this room, we have uh, nine parliamentarians with us. So I'd like to acknowledge them. If you can just put your hands in. So we're represented by nine mm -hmm. countries. Excellent. Our colleague is there also. <laughs> Our other colleague is there. I'm not sure if she got tra the translation. Um, and since I'm in Tanzania, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna take a little bit of advantage here. I see our UCSAF Director General is here, Ms. Ms. Justina. Now, before I get into it, I, I want to put Honorable um, Loila, just one minute, you can give a reaction on what you think, and then I will use my, the rest of my time. I'm putting him on the spot. I want to see if he was paying attention. <laughs> that is really putting him on the spot. <laughs> uh, but yes, you see, when the boss commands, you say, how high do I go? Uh, well, thank you, Honorable Nima, for giving me this opportunity and all the panelists and uh, the distinguished presenters and uh, um, uh, Professor, this is the second time I'm hearing her talking. She gave us some capacity building before we came to this, so it is good to hear you again. Well, um, just within one minute, when I was listening to this carefully, um, it goes back again to what the chair had said, the reason why APNIC was formed, is because most of these things are so, much, so important that um, uh, parliament was missing in action. And when we talked about uh, the ratification of the Malabo uh, protocol, uh, um, uh, how much has parliament been involved in this? We had no idea. I mean, say, I would speak for myself, I only had it when I when I came here, there was something called Malaba Protocol for which countries need to be to ratify and we didn't ratify. And this is an important aspect of life as people move into, the, as, 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 digital, as the digital world is becoming very, very important part of our lives. Now, the challenges, I think the challenges as, as, as were, were, were stated by Dr. Allison, some of them are the things that we have been hearing since morning in, di in, different, in different forums. Infrastructure, connectivity, affordability, whether it is for the devices or for the data itself. And these are challenges that we think 
if, the, if parliamentarians are not involved, including the skills even. We talked, she talked about skills, some of, somewhere she talked about digital skills, I remember somewhere in, 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 the, in the report. Um, and we are privileged to, to, to have had a two days of a capacity building, at least to give us skills to understand some of these things so that as parliamentarians, when they are brought to us, we can raise the questions that are required in order to improve on legislation that will help move forward this um, uh, uh, thing. And we're privileged, and I feel privileged that we are happy that we're here and we could have this knowledge that we have promised to ourselves that we will utilize it to the best when we get back to our countries with your support, if you can support us to push us in order for us to get back to our countries and get this into legislation and move forward this agenda. Thank you. I think that deserves a round of applause and it's... Uh... It, it goes to prove um, or it goes towards removing the notion that African parliamentarians uh, tend to attend these events just for the sake of it and don't pay attention. We at the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance mean business. We are here to do our part. So it is upon you guys to, to, to engage us um, and, and capacitate us. Now, very quickly, before Tracy tells me my time is up, yes. um, <laughs> my reaction. So we're talking about cross-border digital policies. But to me, everything is around data protection. You know, the crust of it is data protection. So there's issue of sovereignty data, sovereignty of the data. Who is owning this data? If I take, for example, for Tanzania, the data is being mined, it's stored in some satellite. Who owns the satellite? When Tanzania wants to access that data, do we get it back for free? Or are we being charged for, you know, sometimes we're being charged to access our own data back. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we, in all honesty, we have to, we have to discuss. Um, there are issues of, you know, the, 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 the revenue generated from our data. Mobile network companies sell our numbers to certain companies and they're generating money. How is that also going to be managed? And this is across, um, across the continent. But there was an issue of regulating data. Um, that was one of the recommendations. But how are we going to regulate data if the parliamentarians are not capacitated to understand all of these dynamics? So then it goes back to, to, to the need of, of involving parliamentarians. But even when we're talking about data protection and all of this, there's an issue of digital inclusion. In Africa, most of the countries, you know, there's a huge digital gap, but there's even further gaps with peripheral regions. Now, when we approach telecom companies to bring access of internet to peripheral regions, they say it doesn't, it doesn't make business case for them. It's not economical. So even with this data protection, this digital policy that we're talking about, this digital data, is it just going to be for urban or is it also going to be for rural? Because if it's going to be for rural, we need to figure out how to take the internet there. But the mobile companies, are saying it's not worth it for them. So the likes of Yuxaf, these, um, these funds, maybe they need to be capacitated to make sure that um, we get the access. And, and, and actually, can I, uh, I really uh, am like what you're saying, uh, Nima, and I, I wanted to also give the opportunity okay. to, to uh, Jean-Paul just to say something. And okay. what, you have, what you've talked about is also um, really key with regard to um, engaging African stakeholders in the international fora and also the parliamentarians. Uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in these debates. So um, I'd like to give the floor to Jean-Paul and then we can come back no and, and talk. Thank okay. you. Oh, I can say one thing and not say what? it again. Okay, go ahead. So the only thing, okay, the one thing that I can say, we always have these beautiful reports being launched and they end up in the shelf. I think it will be very important for this report to be put into action and have in-country initiatives. That's my final point. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to hand over to Jean-Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, and good afternoon to everyone. And as uh, I am representing one of the hosts, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, I would say to you all, Tena Estilin, as they would say in Ethiopia, and welcome. And um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, so first of all, thank you to all of our partners. I think it's been great uh, to have such an uh, engagement. And I think what we, what we are seeing in terms of uh, the digital initiatives in the regional context across the continent is that we we saw a little bit from some of the results that there is a uh, there is a sense that uh, if there are if there is cooperation that's happening maybe it's despite uh, the coordination and the leadership. I tend to be a bit more optimistic because there is a lot being done, 
And we have to realize how relatively recent some of these initiatives are. The African Union Digital Transformation Strategy is from 2020. Uh, we have the dig Data Policy Framework for Digital ID. The Digital Trade Protocol of the African Continental Free Trade Area is still in its final uh, moments of being uh, finalized, but it's, it's going in the right direction. The Malabo Convention is the one that we are worried about, and I'm so pleased we have so many parliamentarians here. We are one country short of it coming into force. So we are very close. And what is interesting to note is that countries have done a lot to actually implement this, this protocol, but they have not yet ratified it. And this, uh, but there are significant movements in this direction. In, we had uh, um, the uh, late last year, the Lome Declaration on Cybersecurity, which again reiterated the need for uh, movements on the Malabo uh, protocol. And ECA is specifically supporting the implementation and anticipating the ratification, which we've worked with a few countries. We're hoping that this may happen very soon. Uh, and we, have set, we are in the process of setting up a regional center of excellence on cybersecurity in Lomé uh, to support countries in terms of implementing uh, cybersecurity efforts and also creating a common framework on cybersecurity, which includes aspects related to data protection, uh, as well as dealing with the threats, which of course, as we have seen increasingly, uh, this includes, this is one of the fronts in terms of warfare. And African countries, I think, are increasingly aware of all the challenges that are linked uh, financially and in terms of their security, in, uh, in terms of cybersecurity. So a few other areas, um, artificial intelligence. Uh, again, ECA is supporting a regional center on artificial intelligence, which is in Brazzaville, Congo. And this is particularly focused on connecting academic institutions uh, to, in, to enhance research which is specific to certain fields on the continent, looking particularly at areas such as agriculture and the fight against climate change. We've also worked with uh, African Enda and the World Bank on, uh, on, on inclusive payment systems across the continent, and I think this is one of the areas where increased coordination among countries will be beneficial. Uh, Africa is one of the regions which has innovated in payment systems. Um, mobile money, was invented in Africa. But as the Honorable uh, uh, Nima mentioned, we still have that issue of last mile. Um, so even though we've, we've used these uh, mobile phones, for example, to connect payments even in rural areas, but we have not yet fully solved the issue of inclusion. But we have the starting point and we can build on that. Uh, digital ID frameworks and, and cooperation among countries and sharing of best practices can also be an opportunity. And ECA has worked with the government of Ethiopia on their national ID, national digital ID framework, which was adopted in August of this year. And it's in the spirit of leaving no one behind and being able to provide government services uh, using digital uh, frameworks. Uh, in the context of trade, um, we also need to look at the vehicles that can facilitate this. And I would like to cite the example of the African uh, Trade Exchange Platform, or ATEX. Uh, and this is something we have worked with Africa and Bank to deliver connectivity between uh, providers of goods, as well as the link to financing through Africa and Bank, and the platform uh, to, to be able to provide that access at the global level. I'm getting some looks now, so I know I have to wrap up. Uh, but to, to conclude, to conclude, uh, I would say uh, three key points. Firstly, capacity building, uh, being able to invest in young people in particular to be able to improve uh, the uh, understanding of how we can access uh, digital technologies and sharing of experiences in those aspects. Uh, secondly, building resilience, and I think a lot of the uh, resilience of systems is going to be designed around regional initiatives. We can reduce the costs of implementing a lot of these best practices by, do it, by acting regionally. And thirdly, uh, payment systems, which I think is one of the key elements and building blocks. And again, this will be ineffective unless we can address it regionally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John Paul, and for also wrapping it up quickly as well. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to check if uh, Dr. Andrew Renz, are you available online? Can you hear us? No. Our, our IT team, can you please unmute him? 
Andrew Renz. Muted, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Um, as we are um, limited with time, if you could just share your quick reactions in a minute um, to uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Alison Gilwall shared, uh, that would be great. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. So, so Vision 2063 uh, talks about an integrated Africa and uh, the report, uh, as well as the African data policy framework, um, suggests that one of the important components of that is cross-border data sharing. And so the question I have for uh, today's session going forward and beyond today is, so how do we do that? How do we bring about data sharing across borders in Africa? Not just the personal data, which Honorable Lugangira um, spoke about and which requires certain safety guards, but also other types of data, non-personal data, which also has important economic and developmental um, benefits. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, I know you did. You did that really well in one minute. <laughs> um, For an academic, that's, exactly. That's that is that is amazing, and so and a legal academic and a legal <laughs> academic. Excellent. Thank you very much for for sharing that um, those points. And as we're coming to the end of this session, I wanted to hand over to Martin. Uh, um, it seems that the. PowerPoint is down, but uh, he's just going to take us through the next steps and what we can expect. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you so much again to our esteemed panelists, also to our supporters that enable the preparation of the report. And um, the report is a stepping stone towards the many points that you actually were making now about the question of implementation and also increasing data and digital literacy in order to actually act now. So once we have our slides back on the screen from our IT colleagues, let's see if the screen plays with us or if it doesn't. If it doesn't, I will just you know uh, play it by ear. So part of the project now in the coming uh, three months will be that we will use the content of the report findings and we will, together with a dedicated service, now try to translate that into uh, onboarding learning modules for specific audiences. And given what we hear today, and also given also the participation of our esteemed parliamentarians from the region, what we would like to also propose, and that's an offer, um, is that as part of the workshops that we are foreseeing in the coming months, that we would also like to leverage the methodology of the Internet Jurisdiction Policy Network of co-developing those learning modules, because this is about the substance that we create, and there's a lot of know-how already within the report, but I think something that always comes short in many of the mechanisms that develop this learning content, there's too little peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And we have a lot of colleagues also from other Global South representation in Latin America, or also from other Global South regions in the world, that had similar challenges, and they would like to also share their insights and also their experiences, amongst others, other parliamentarians. So that would be an offer that we can make today, and we'll discuss you know, how we could put that into action. Um, and these learning modules, at a certain point, will also lead to the possibility of certifying knowledge. And for us, this is a starting point of creating a baseline, and then we will also investigate together what are the additional areas where we could dig deeper. What are the topical areas? What are the sectoral questions related to AI or to you know, mobile payments across borders? What are solution pathways that might be interesting to actually onboard also the relevant stakeholders on? So this phase now will be pretty exciting to actually embark upon because it will not just be about the report. It will now be about the question, how do we put all of it into action? Uh, and there's such an appetite and there's so little time to put things into action. So we should have started last year. You know, and uh, we admit this openly. And uh, we couldn't be happier to have you with us here in the room. And I would be amiss not to make also an additional announcement. Uh, the Internet Jurisdiction Policy Network will have its town hall session on the 1st of December, also here at the IGF. We will be presenting other activities as well. And uh, there will be one announcement also that we'll make. I won't be disclosing too much information, but we will be starting uh, in next year uh, a new project related to cross-border sandboxes for data in Africa. 
as a potential solution pathway as an African forum. And we will also investigate then there in the session and also in the intersessional discussions on who the right partners are to then jointly identify areas and sectors where there would be the biggest willingness to engage in experimental cross-border sharing of information where the urgency is the greatest, where the political buy-in is the uh, most considerable, and also where technical solutions are already existing now to actually have lighthouse projects that showcase African stakeholders and actual you know, coalitions can be an example for other regions of actually putting things into action. So with this, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the findings. And we'll be here available, of course, with our esteemed also authoring team, to whom I also want to do a big shout out again. And a big thank you for having you know, supported us so far, also in the writing of the report, uh, to answer any questions that are there, because we are too short on time for the Q&A, which, as usual at the IGF, is so unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> but we'll be here. Don't hesitate to grab us. And thank you again so much for having joined us today, and thank you again for having enabled us to present today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs>